Well, it is seven o'clock, so I'm going to kick this off. My computer has a mind of its own here. Uh, welcome to the Ecology and Management of Fish in New Hampshire's Lakes uh, webinar presentation hosted today by New Hampshire Lakes and presented uh, by our uh, friends and partners at the New Hampshire Department of Fish and Game, New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. And I see a lot of friendly faces out there this evening. Welcome back. Uh, for those of you who have been with us over the past four or five uh, sessions here, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, this session is being recorded. I'm currently recording. Um, participants, you will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but you will be able to type in your questions into the chat box. And Jessica and I will do our best to answer those questions as the presentation goes on. But of course, we will save the tricky ones for Scott, our, uh, our expert at the end. You're welcome to leave your camera on. Just remember that others can see you. And if you do happen to get a message that says your internet connection is unstable, the first thing you might wanna try is just turning off your camera. Sometimes that helps keep the connection. Um, so after this session, you'll receive an email from me um, asking you to evaluate uh, the session. Let us know how we did and let us know about things you want to learn in the future. And then tomorrow, you'll get an email from me with links to this recording and to the slides and to all the other presentations we've given over the past couple weeks. So your host this evening, again, I'm Andrea Lamoureux, Vice President with New Hampshire Lakes, and Jessica Sayers, our Conservation Program Assistant. She's waving there. She's in the house as well. Again, we'll be trying to help you with any technical difficulties along the way and also trying to answer your questions. Um, so those of you who are new, uh, New Hampshire Lakes, we're hosting this. We are the only member-supported nonprofit organization working for all of New Hampshire's 1,000 lakes. We are a membership-supported organization, and I know we have a lot of members in the audience tonight. Thank you to you members who um, support us financially to help us do this good work. If you aren't a member, September is a great month to become a New Hampshire Lakes member. Uh, we're running a uh, special program, New Member September. If you join us in September, you have a chance to win a number of really awesome prizes. Uh, so go to nhlakes.org to find out more. So our mission, simply put, is to keep New Hampshire's lakes clean and healthy uh, now and in the future. And we work with partners, folks like New Hampshire Fish and Game, uh, excellent biologists like Scott Decker. We help promote clean water policies and hopefully encourage uh, people to care for our lakes, to enjoy them and, and to enjoy them in a, in a way that they're around for others in the future. Our programs, if you know us, we do advocacy at the state level, we do conservation, you may know us through our courtesy boat inspection program, our lake host program, where we try to keep our lakes, lakes free from invasive plants and animals. We have um, a new program, our Lake Smart Lake Friendly Living program, where we're visiting with property owners throughout the state to give them recommendations and ideas how to live in a more lake friendly way. And outreach. In a typical summer, we travel around the state meeting with families um, at public events, festivals, doing hands-on education things, games, activities. We couldn't do that this summer, so instead we're doing these outreach uh, webinars, and I think this is like our 13th or 14th webinar we've done. They are all on our website, and um, you can view them at your leisure. So, um, Again, without any further ado, I am going to turn this over to our guest presenter, Scott Decker from the Fish and Game Department, and I'm stopping sharing, and Scott, you should be able to share your screen. All right, uh, hopefully I can hit the button and it will work. <laughs> and if I go to right there, and it's thinking, oh, I got to hit the share button, there. Oh, there we go. Looks good, it's coming. All right. Oh, there it is. All right. Are we ready? You're ready. Take it All away. Right. Thank you, Andrea. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's uh, webinar. Um, so we've heard in this series, we've heard talks on water quality. We've heard talks on invasive plants um, and animals. And we've heard talks on plant life in lakes. 
And also we've had the safety talk from Captain Dunleavy. So what's left to talk about? Well, how about some of the critters that live in our lakes? And some of those main critters are fish, of course. And so tonight I wanna to cover some basic ecology or biology of some of our lake fishes and the management of those fishes. And, um, but first I just wanna, I'd like to let people know where I'm kind of coming from. I'm actually uh, not a native New Englander or native to New Hampshire, just like a lot of our fish, I, actually, that are, they're, they're not native that I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, I grew up in the state of Michigan, you talk about lakes. I'm, I grew up in the state of Michigan in, in, a, in a town called Traverse City. Maybe some of you have been there. And it's right at the base of Grand Traverse Bay here. I probably swam in Lake Michigan every day as a kid uh, during the summer. Uh, fished its streams, fished the lakes in the area. So I guess I am a lake person at heart. Uh, I really enjoy them and spending time out there on lakes. And um, so growing up in Traverse City, I ended up going to college at Michigan State. Uh, of course, that's when they didn't have good sports teams back then. So, <laughs> but now they kind of do. Is everybody hearing me okay? Everything okay? Okay. Uh, so in 1984, I migrated east and ended up going to school in Durham for a couple of years and got a graduate degree there in, in wildlife ecology. And then I got hired by uh, Fishing Game in 1986, working out of Concord. And for a few months, but then we opened up, I was shipped up to the North Country in Lancaster when we opened up the first regional office at Fishing Game in, in the spring of 1987. And so I spent about 13 years uh, roaming the, the, the streams, the ponds and lakes of Coas County uh, and uh, learned quite a bit. And so I'm kind of familiar with that area of the state. And, uh, but, that, but after leaving the North Country, I migrated back down to Concord, back downstream, if you, you might say, uh, and uh, took a position as the habitat biologist for a few years. And then from there, I, I moved up to the program supervisor and I've been there for the last 16 years in that position. So just a brief history, bear with me. I just want to let, like to let folks know where, where kind of I'm coming from. All right, so uh, I think what's important to note that, you know, as a, as a department, as a state agency, uh, uh, and the management of uh, public waters. And I'm sure some of you, maybe many of you know about RSA 27120 uh, <clears throat> that states that any, uh, any body of water, 10 acres or greater is a public and is owned by the state and is held in trust for the state for public use. And that allows the Fish and Game Department to do what we do for management. And, uh, and, and so that's, that covers the RSA and the and what public waters mean. I also like to point out to folks because because some folks don't realize how actually we're funded. I'm not going to go into detail here on every section here, but you, the, the two bigger sections of the pie chart here shows uh, license revenue. We get most of our a lot of our funds, of course, from sale of fishing and hunting licenses, and but we also get a lot of federal funding. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. We get very little general funds. You see 2%, very little sliver here of general fund money. So it's, it's like a user pay uh, uh, system. So, you know, when people say, oh, my tax dollars are funding fishy game. Well, that's not really true. It's, it's your fishing licenses that, that do most of it and, they, and they're matched with federal, federal funds. So how does that federal funding program work? Well, we call it, it's called the Sport Fish Restoration Program. And it uh, came about, oh God, going on 70 years ago now, um, back in 1950, it was known as the, the Dingle Johnson Act, the two senators that sponsored the legislation. And we call it DJ, the DJ funding or DJ program for short. Basically what it is, <clears throat> is a tax. It's levied at the manufacturer's level on sport fishing equipment, uh, boat motors, uh, anything to do with fishing, fishing equipment. Uh, that's how those funds are raised. And it provides uh, a, a reimbursement rate of up to 75% uh, <clears throat> and with a 25% state match. And that 25% comes from the license sales that I mentioned. And there's a formula that the, the apportionment formula is based on number of licenses sold in the land area in each state. And so we don't get, we're at, we're, we're, New Hampshire is called 
a minimum proportion state because we're very small um, compared to other states. So what does it pay for? It pays for all kinds of work, uh, projects that restore, conserve, and manage uh, sport fisheries. And uh, also there's some funding for uh, aquatic education built into the system too. Now, um, I'm seeing um, some folks here on my screen on the right that kind of covers the slide. Is that going to be an issue, Andrea? Or No, we can see your, um, your okay. screen just fine. Okay, all right. And uh, oh, the uh, last point is that about 3.7 3, 3. million was apportioned in our most recent fiscal year uh, of federal funding. So a good chunk. All right, so let's get to the, the main thing here uh, tonight. I'm gonna to talk, uh, um, first of all, about the biology of some of our freshwater fishes uh, that inhabit lakes. Um, uh, I'm only gonna hit sort of the, the, there's over 55 species of freshwater fish it, that inhabit um, our lakes, ponds, and streams in the state. Uh, I'm only gonna talk about the most popular dozen or so. Um, we sort of divide them into two groups, the cold water, a group of fish, which include your trouts here um, and your salmon, landlocked salmon is what we have here. And then the, the warm water group, you know, encompasses uh, most everything else, your basses here, your pickerels, your sunfish uh, and your perches and your bullheads. Or as I learned when I got to New Hampshire, they're called hornpout. And I still, I call them hornpout now, but I, I didn't learn it that way in Michigan. <laughs> All right, so uh, brook trout, uh, of course, is a very one of our most colorful fish uh, trouts. Um, you can see that uh, the coloration, these little uh, worm-like markings on the back, we call them vermiculations, is one of the key factors to how to identify them. Uh, they'll have uh, these red spots with the blue halos along their flanks. That's another key thing, and then. These, the fins uh, have this uh, combination of a white line on the edge followed by a black line. That is, that is pretty much key for the brook trout. No other trout looks like that. And the males color up nice in the fall uh, during spawning time um, when these fish, you know, carry on their life cycle. I'm not going to read every single bullet on the slide here, but uh, just to know that the brook trout is our, our state fish. Uh, uh, in New Hampshire. Um, <clears throat> it's found, you know, mostly where you're going to find your coldest water, all right? Um, they, need, they need water temperatures. Uh, they're, they're, the trout probably needs the coldest water, maybe except for lake trout. But, uh, and mostly a small lake fish, really. Uh, we have stock populations, uh, as well as some, a few wild uh, lake populations around the state, but not not many wild populations uh, in in ponds. They're more they're more in small brooks and streams. Um, so, anyways, uh, they I mentioned they fall they do spawn in the fall time. And each slide here, as I go through, you'll see at the bottom this this is the state record. That's what SR stands for, and you'd see it's quite an old for the brook trout. It's a nine pound fish from Pleasant Lake uh, up in New London. So that that's one of our older uh, records. The brown trout um, is not a native like the brook trout. This was uh, brought into this country in the late 1800s. Um, browns, you know, the, uh, have spotting on the sides. Usually uh, some of the spotting can be reddish, but they also have these, these lighter colored halos uh, around the darker or red spots. Um, they, they'll vary in coloration from this yellowish brownish color uh, to, to almost a silvery color like a salmon and that's one of the fish that, that get confused a lot is brown trout and salmon they they sometimes can look a lot alike um, as I mentioned not a native introduced um, a couple of different strains that came from either Scotland called the Loch Leven trout or the German brown trout the von Beer strain those are the two strains that were imported to this country um, uh, quite a while ago. In general, the brown trout can withstand uh, a lot warmer water. I mean, not really, really warm water, like a warm water fish, like a bass, but they can do better uh, in warmer water than, say, brook trout can. <clears throat> and they're also a fall spawner. Um, they run up out of the lakes, uh, 
into the streams to spawn if, if they're naturally spawning. But we do, uh, we do depend on our stock trout to, to help support fisheries for a lot of our trout. <clears throat> As I mentioned, it's a close relative of the Atlantic salmon. Uh, the third trout species that we have in the state here is, is a lot of people know this, recognize this one as the rainbow trout. Obviously has this pink stripe, how it gets its name down the side. And what I think about, when I think about the rainbow trout, I think spots, spots, spots. They have spots everywhere, tail, on, on the sides, on the dorsal fin, on this little fleshy fin here called the adipose fin. It has spots. So that's kind of the key characteristic along with the, uh, the pink stripe. It's kind of the, the rainbow is kind of in between a brown trout and a brook trout as far as temperature tolerance goes. Um, they don't live in the coldest water, but they don't like the really, really warm water either. Um, and again, a non native uh, introduced actually from California um, back in the late 1800s. And this, this naturally spawns this. The rainbow trout spawns in the springtime as opposed to the, the, the brook trout or the brown trout. It's also the least tolerant of uh, low pH. So that's, that's really why we don't have a lot of natural reproduction of, of rainbow trout in New Hampshire is because of our, our soils tend to be acidic and it doesn't really support um, rainbow trout uh, in any great degree. <clears throat> there are a few streams that have natural rainbows in it, but not many. And it is, uh, in recent years, probably, well, in the last 20 years or so, it has become a more popular fish in some of our larger lakes uh, to, uh, as an alternative to salmon, uh, like Winnipesaukee, the rainbow trout are doing very well, Newfound Lake, uh, we have them there too. Salmon, now, uh, what we call a Lake Atlantic salmon um, is, a, is a basically, just like the Atlantic salmon, the migratory species is the same fish, although it has become landlocked and lost its migra uh, urge to migrate. Um, so they, they, once they're stocked, and it's all supported by stocking, we don't have really any natural um, salmon uh, populations, except for maybe the Connecticut lakes. They do have some natural spawning up there. But it's a very silvery fish uh, with the dark spots on the side. Um, it has a fairly uh, narrow caudal peduncle here and, and a forked tail, more so than a trout. Uh, that's, so that's how you tell the difference. You look at the tail sometimes and it has a more forked tail. Like I mentioned, um, the other main term we call it, uh, we refer to them as landlocked salmon. Um, and the, again, introduced the, we did have naturally many, many years ago, natural runs of you know wild Atlantic salmon, um, but these that we have now are I could say came from New Brunswick. The strain was originally introduced in the late 1800s, and uh, they just lost that that migratory urge, and that's why they stay in the lakes. We have about 14 lakes throughout the state that we manage them in. Most of our larger lakes: Winnipesaukee, Newfound, Sunapee. Um, Newfound, and then the Connecticut Lakes, and then a, a few assorted others. Uh, it does uh, spawn in the fall, um, it, and it does uh, smelt, uh, are a very important forage uh, for the Atlantic salmon or landlocked salmon. And Pleasant Lake has the, uh, has the state record. Actually, there was two fish, one from 1914 and one 1942, the same exact size pretty much. Um, the other cold water fish um, that m many people may know about is the lake trout. Uh, they tend to get, they can get very large, uh, and we do have some nice specimens around the state in, in a couple of different lakes here. You know, the lake trout is basically an olive green coloration to it. It's very closely related to brook trout because uh, it does have a, a white margin on the fin, as you can see down here. Um, but doesn't have the red spots at all. There's no, no, no red spots. They're just these light, light colored spots. Uh, they're dwellers of the deep. Um, they, they really need deep cold water to su survive. They are native, one of our native fish. 
and but only native to about seven lakes. Um, but we've also, uh, through stocking, we have, they're currently self-sustaining themselves in about 15 lakes nowadays. But we don't, like I say, we don't stock them anymore. We used to have a stocking program, but we found that it was better to just manage them, you know, on their own without, without hatchery fish. Uh, it's another fall spawning fish. So, and I'll mention a little bit farther under the management section of how we, how we go about sampling, you know, lake trout in the, uh, in the fall. It's very long lived and it's just a very slow, slow growing fish. And uh, they can get, they can get kind of big up to, up to, we've had one that was almost 40, uh, 36 pounds there. Actually, a new state record uh, over the winter time was caught in uh, Big Diamond Pond. All right, so leaving the cold water fish, now let's talk a little bit about the warm water species, which are probably more prevalent uh, in the state. And uh, one of the most popular fish nowadays is the largemouth bass. Probably the most popular fish in the whole country, actually. Uh, a lot of people, you know, participate in in tournament fishing and it's pop, been popularized by programs on uh, TV. And, and so, so it's come, become very popular as a, as a species in the, not only in New Hampshire, but uh, obviously across the, across the country. Again, largemouth bass are not native to New Hampshire. They, they were brought in a long time ago, probably again, late 1800s, uh, early part of the, early part of the 1900s. Uh, they need, uh, you know, very uh, weedy uh, lakes that they do well in. Um, they typically spawn in the springtime, and the male does all the work primarily. Uh, he'll he'll build the nest and and coax the female to the nest in, in the springtime. You'll see in the shallows usually the depression, the circular depressions, uh, usually with a cover object like a log or a bigger boulder next to it. So um, then when the female comes in, they, they mate and she lays her eggs and the male does uh, all the guarding of the eggs. So the female comes in and then she bugs out. And then, so the male takes care of the eggs and then, and keeps out, you know, other fish that want to, that want to try to eat the eggs. And uh, he does, I say, he does the parental care. After they're hatched even, he'll, he'll hang around the fry before the fry actually break up. Um, and, you know, it'll eat pretty much anything that moves, uh, and, and, you know, fish, frogs, crayfish, invertebrates, mice, snakes, even, even birds or small ducklings, uh, a big, a big bass will take. And our state record's about 10 and a half pounds. And that, that's getting to be an old record. It's back from the late sixties. The other warm water bass that we have here is a smallmouth bass. Again, uh, a little bit different in coloration that they have the more of a vertical barring on the side uh, versus the uh, the large mouth had the horizontal stripe here that's the telltale sign of the, the large mouth but they do vary in coloration depending on the type of water that they're in um, again introduced as I mentioned uh, the, the the bass are more native to the center part of the country the Mississippi drainage and the Great Lakes in that area a little bit different habitat um, the smallmouth like more of a rocky uh, uh, and not very weedy area with a clean sort of firm bottoms not the mucky bottom type type lakes uh, that largemouth prefer and the spawning uh, is very much the same as the largemouth bass. The male does all the does, does most of the work, and uh, crayfish and invertebrates and, and other fish are, are popular food items. You see the state record there from Goose Pond. Probably pound per pound, uh, the you know the gamest fish around. Uh, they 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 really when you when you hook one, they they like to jump and leap, and it's uh, it's it's quite a fight sometimes. And oh, here's a slide. Uh, it shows the side by side, sort of largemouth up on top here, and the smallmouth here. See the see the edge of the, the the mandible here goes past the rear edge of the eye. While in the smallmouth, you know the, the the mandible doesn't go past the eye. That's that's the difference. One of the main characteristics, other than the coloration. 
how about a couple of sunfish? Um, the pumpkin seed, uh, is a good name for that. It's shaped like a pumpkin seed, I guess. And uh, probably the main way to distinguish these from other sunfish is a little red uh, dot on the opercular flap here. Uh, that's kind of a key thing there uh, for the pumpkin seed. Also called the common sunfish is another name. Um, the pumpkin seed is native, is, is our native sunfish, and probably one of the more you know, prevalent species in, in our lakes here, in our warm water lakes. It is a spring spawner, or, or actually a, more of a, a late spring, early summer, and can actually nest a couple of times through the, through the season. And the nest sometimes, you'll see them in the shallows, uh, these circular depressions, just like the basses do, but they'll be in, in groups, so kind of, they're kind of like colonial nesters at times. So um, that's just sort of their thing that they do. They, 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 they don't nest sort of solitary like the bass do, but, but sometimes in groups. And they're fun to catch. Uh, great way to introduce kids to fishing. Now the other sunfish that seems to be very popular these days is the bluegill. Uh, uh, the coloration can vary, but you can see the bluish color here on the, uh, the gill, gill covers. They have a flap an opercular flap, you know, just like the other sunfish, but there's no, there's no red spot like the pumpkin seed. And you'll see these vertical bars on them at times. And they get, the, they, they grow, uh, they can get up to, you know, 10, 11, 12 inches even. That's, that's a really good size bluegill, but uh, that's a good size to fillet actually. And they're, they're very good eating. If you've never tried eating any of the sunfish species, um, you should try it sometime. Uh, Again, I prefer very weedy, you know, warm, warm uh, ponds. Um, I mentioned the spawning already and a variety of food, food items it takes, uh, even some vegetation sometimes that uh, it'll, it'll take and can tolerate a very, very warm water temperature, you know, up in the 80s. And it does, it does very well. Uh, ah. Another sunfish, some people don't, may not think this is a sunfish, but it is. Uh, the black crappie is uh, somewhat new on the, on the scene here in New Hampshire. It was probably first found in the mid, in the mid 70s uh, in the state, not, not stocked by the fishing game department, but um, brought in by some, some angler or, or, or may have been through uh, the bait industry could have been accidentally mixed in somehow, little small ones. Uh, but very popular nowadays with anglers. And uh, <clears throat> the coloration on them is this, this sort of this dark uh, blotchiness uh, uh, and, a, and a yellowish or greenish background. Uh, they also have sort of like a, almost like a humpback, you know, with this, you can see how their back goes, goes sharply up like that from the head. Uh, they're a schooling fish. Uh, if you find a school of crappies, it's, uh, you know, you're usually going to catch more than one. Uh, and uh, I can say becoming a very popular winter, winter or ice fishery in New Hampshire. Um, so it's, yeah, and currently you can find crappies now in over 120 water bodies throughout the state. And, and like I say, uh, mostly uh, through illegal transfers. Uh, but we, as a fishing game department, we have trans transplanted some of them around too. So that's how, that's a part of our management. And let's see, what else about the crappie that I want to say? Oh, it's, it's like I say, it's highly prized, it's table fare. Um, and you could see recently, new record, just a few years ago, was caught in Great East Lake. Almost three pounds. Okay, now the, the perches, uh, uh, the yellow perch is probably one of the most common fish in all of New Hampshire, Pro virtually found in every water body throughout the state, uh, except for very, very far northern Coas County. They don't have them in the Connecticut Lakes area. But it's a typically yellowish fish with these uh, green uh, sort of deep V marks on them and the orangish fins. Those are, that's kind of a key characteristic. Um, sometimes referred to as a cool water fish, not as a warm water fish. They don't like water temperatures as warm as the bass or sunfish. And uh, so 
they'll be found in the sort of the cold, colder areas of lakes a lot of times. I mean, in the springtime, obviously they'll be in the shallows spawning, but they don't make nests uh, like the bass or the sunfish do. They sort of broadcast their eggs, uh, you know, on vegetation or submerged uh, wood or, or trees in, in lakes. And, you know, these, we call them skeins. This, you, probably, you may have seen them in the spring, these gelatinous ribbons uh, of eggs are just sort of strung over the vegetation and there's no nest making involved. And I grew up, you know, in Michigan, eating perch is a regular meal. You know, that was a regular meal. You could buy them frozen uh, in the grocery stores. Um, very common out there. Um, but in recent years, the yellow perch have, haven't done so well in the Great Lakes because of the zebra mussels infestation that, that came on it. Uh, another perch we have um, that's actually uh, was introduced to our freshwater lakes uh, a number of years ago is the white perch. It's more of a, an estuarine uh, brackish water fish, um, but does well in our freshwaters here and, and can get to, to be a good size. It's basically uh, uh, very silvery in appearance um, and um, looks almost striped bass shaped. And, 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 and it, is, it is a close relative of the striped bass. Uh, but doesn't grow as big, obviously. And uh, this is a schooling fish. Uh, uh, they can suspend over deep water and um, uh, they'll eat mostly invertebrates and other fish. And again, like uh, the yellow, they're broadcast spawners. And um, one, one, usual, one unusual thing that we've seen in some of our big lakes, like Winnipesaukee, is sometimes in the spring you'll see these big, huge white perch that are like, they look like they're struggling on the surface. Well, they're, they're, they're the big females that are so swollen up with eggs that it, they can't uh, control their buoyancy very well. Uh, their swim bladder gets kind of messed up. So maybe some of you have seen this uh, uh, happen. So it's, it's, it's not, it may not be anything wrong with the fish. It's just having trouble controlling its buoyancy. And after it expels its eggs, it, it usually, you know, does better. But uh, I mean, they're not in the salt water. They don't grow as big as they do in the fresh water. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting and they are highly prized as a table fare. Um, one, one other native fish, very different shaped uh, compared to the other, some of the other warm water fish is the, is the chain pickerel. And it's very aptly named. Uh, you can see the, these chain like uh, markings on a background of uh, yellowish greenish color. Uh, it's very torpedo shaped and that's, that's designed, uh, it's sort of an ambush predator. It, it, lies, it lies in the weeds and just waits for a minnow to swim by and it, and it darts out uh, to capture its prey. So it, so it doesn't do a lot of long distance swimming. It mostly just sits and waits and uh, to, to capture its prey. You can see it's designed for that. The, the uh, dorsal fin, and the anal fin and the tail fin, you know, all, all sort of combined to give it that thrust, how they're, how they're moved back here on the fish compared to other fish. So it's, it's a good, good mechanism for, for catching prey. Uh, they're broadcast spawners. Um, uh, they don't make nests and they usually spawn almost right after ice out, or even sometimes when there's still a little bit of ice left on the lakes, so they'll, they'll be spawning. We also have, I don't, I'm not gonna mention it too much, we also have pike in some lakes in New Hampshire, not very many, mostly in the Connecticut River. Uh, Northern pike is, is very closely related to the chain pickerel. They can get, the, the pike can get very, uh, a lot larger than our, than our native pickerel. I think the state record, yeah, is about eight pounds, which is a pretty good size pickerel. Uh, and actually uh, Plumber Lake, I was looking this up the other day and Plumber Lake actually is, is a portion is actually Hermit Lake, uh, I just found out. So uh, I, I was always confused where Plumber Lake was and I did some research and it's actually Hermit Lake in, in Samberton. Of course, we can't forget the brown bullhead uh, or horn pout uh, as it's known. It's uh, in the catfish family. Uh, catfish are 
One of the defining characteristics are the whiskers the, or barbels as they're referred to up, up near the mouth. They also have uh, spines. They have a dorsal spine uh, right here on the leading edge of the anal fin or the dorsal fin. And they have spines on uh, either, either side of the pectoral fin. So you gotta be very careful when you're handling uh, horn pout because they, they, they can stab you. Um, probably the most uh, neat thing about the brown bull is it can stand very low dissolved oxygen levels. Um, I mean, they can actually survive out of the water for a little bit and, and they, they respire a little bit sometimes through their skin. Um, so, uh, um, and, and one of the things, you know, I guess was popular and probably still is with some folks is, is going horn pouting at night uh, and usually using cat food or some other smelly bait uh, is a good way to catch them. Um, they do spawn in the, in the late spring, you know, when the temperatures get to a certain about mid 60s, 65 degrees or so. Um, and both, both parents do, do uh, care for their young and their eggs. And sometimes you'll see these little black masses of the young uh, with the adult kind of hovering around them in the springtime or, or the, the early summer. And, oh, okay. Um, the rock bass is, seems to be in the, in the news lately or in the, on the social media pages lately that I follow. Um, it is in the sunfish family. And of course it's, it's, it's uh, the one, one way to ID them is you know, this sort of these, these, these dark lines and blotches of coloration that they have on the sides. And, and the other thing is the red eye. Okay, look for the red eye in a sunfish-like shape there. And it's probably a rock bass that you've caught. Um, introduced, of course, from the Midwest. Uh, uh, usually prefers a rocky, you know, type shoreline, that kind of habitat. And sometimes I've seen them suspend over structure in, in water up to 25, 30 feet deep. Um, it's a spring spawner. Uh, they do like the other sunfish and the bass, the male builds nests uh, and cares for the eggs. Um, sometimes problematic, it's seen as a competitor for smallmouth bass, so smallmouth bass anglers uh, tend to gripe about the rock bass uh, uh, a little bit. I think there was a question I saw in the chat about rock bass, so we'll try to, try to figure that out or a little bit later, I guess. Uh, anyway, so. What's next? Oh, okay. Uh, just a quick shot of some of the forage species that those, uh, the game fish sort of depend on. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the life history of all these fish, but you, things like shiners, golden shiners, very popular. Uh, this is what, this is what uh, uh, anglers will use for wintertime bait. All the bait shops sell these, uh, the golden shiners, sometimes they're called Arkansas shiners. because a lot of the bait comes from, uh, originates from out of state. So, and down in some of the southern states there. Uh, the fall fish, very, one of our largest minnow species can get up to three pounds in some of our large lakes. Usually a river fish, but it can inhabit lakes also. Suckers, of course, very popular, are, are very prevalent throughout the state. Um, and all these, all these species here are pretty much native. Uh, I'm not sure about the golden shiner. We do have a, a common shiner. I do have a good slide, of, a picture of a common shiner. Uh, or redfin shiner, as it's called. That's our that's a native fish. Lake chubs. Some of our northern lakes have lake chubs in them. Good good forage fish. And then the uh, rainbow smelt, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the management section here. Uh, very important for our salmon fisheries throughout the state. All right. So uh, moving on from biology, how are we doing for time here? I, let's see. Yeah, I guess I think we're doing okay. Uh, so. We have the fish, but we also have fish, what, fisheries management. Um, and the term that I, uh, or the definition that I like uh, um, is, is this one, is that fisheries management consists of the interrelated process of planning and taking actions to manipulate fish populations, fish habitat, and people to achieve specific human objectives. So, um, so it's just not about the fish, all right? It's not about the biology of the fish. Uh, 
fish biologists and fisheries managers uh, work with folks to to improve fisheries and and because um, um, it's important you know the recreational aspect uh, of, of fish uh, in fishing is very important to folks. So our fisheries programs that I that I manage as a program supervisor are basically five programs. I'm not going to talk about all these in detail. Um, the first uh, the Large Lake Fisheries uh, Program, Warm Water and Cold Water Fisheries are pretty much the lake related uh, programs that we have. Uh, habitat and Fisheries Conservation are two other uh, programs that more, deal more with um, uh, stream fisheries and things of uh, that nature. But um, so I just wanted to make that distinction. Uh, so some of our management uh, of landlocked salmon involves uh, in the springtime, we, we're, uh, we, one of our hatcheries that raises the salmon, one of the things we do is we, we mark them or we do a fin clip uh, on all the yearling salmon before they're stocked out. And what this does is, is helps us when we do our evaluations, our netting in the fall, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, it, it lets us know when that fish was stocked. And so we can tell you know, the age of those fishes as they move through the fishery. And this is one of our uh, uh, coding pages here uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, it shows you, you know, uh, various fin clips that we use. We clipped adipose fins and usually the left or right ventral fin. Um, and th these are the codes that we use and we're able to track the ages of the fish over time. So in the fall, in, in most of our big lake, and actually we concentrate on three of our lakes, Sunapee, uh, Squam, and Wittipasaki on, on evaluating our salmon. So nets, we set nets in the fall, and you know this is some of the data that we collect uh, on the fish that, uh, that we trap in our nets here. What it basically does, uh, it, it's set off of the shoreline, this leader comes out, and what to do, the fish, the fish swim along the shore, they're looking, for a stream to spawn in, even though we, they don't, we don't have a lot of streams that are big enough for salmon to spawn naturally, they'll still go through the motions and look for flowing water. So this is actually the Melvin village here. The Melvin River comes in right about here. And uh, the, this net, we call a pound net because we use these poles here, we pound them into the sediment to hold up the netting. Uh, so pound net is the name. And so anyways, the fish swim along the shallows and then they're funneled into the, the trap here. And uh, then, we're, then we're able to, we pull up next to them in a boat and we're able to dip the fish out and take them back to shore where we work them up. We measure and weigh, weigh the fish. Uh, we age them. We look for that fin clip. Remember, uh, I mentioned the fin clips so we know how old they are and measure their body condition and how well they're doing. Uh, and that's, this is just what they look like in the fall. They do darken up. The males especially uh, will, will get a lot darker than that. Uh, this is a female. Uh, the males will develop more of a, a hook jaw or a kite. Uh, and so you can really tell the difference. Um, some of you may have come to our Salmon Sunday event that we hold each year in Melvin Village. Uh, we have a spot there on the Melvin River where we do our uh, salmon uh, we strip the uh, eggs from the females and just kind of go through the process here. It's more or less for show. We don't actually use the eggs uh, during Salmon Sunday because we've already collected our, our eggs that we need uh, for the year, usually a couple days before that. So check it out. I'm not sure if we're going to have it this year because of the whole uh, pandemic thing. I think it, it's sort of tentatively planned, but it may not happen. Uh, the other thing we do in the fall uh, for management on our lake trout is we do what we call our uh, gill netting uh, on the reefs. Um, the, the lake trout, when they spawn, they come in from the deep and into the as water as shallow as uh, a foot deep onto these rocky shoals. Uh, and that's where they spawn. Like the witches uh, is a good spot uh, in Wittipasaki to sample these fish. Uh, again, we're taking data, lengths, weights, scales, sometimes to age the fish. And uh, uh, it's just more of a monitoring situation. We're not stocking these. These are all wild fish here. These are all, uh, let's see, 
uh, naturally spawned in the lakes. So, oh yeah, this is some of the data, kind of just summarizes what we do do with the lake trout. And they do get fairly large, uh, you know, 30 plus pounds, you know, which is a very old fish. This guy was very old and he had sort of a beat up tail. And I think we caught him a couple couple of years in a row because we, we remember the, the, the beat up tail on this one, this guy. I was over in New Benusa. The other thing we do on our large lakes is uh, we do hydroacoustic uh, assessments of, of our forage fish, primarily smelt. We do this at night. Uh, this shows uh, Winnipesaukee with some of the transect lines that we do where we take our research vessel. We, we run transects with a very fancy sonar unit to collect data on the smelt. This is the, this is the boat that we use, a 22 foot Eastern lobster style boat. Uh, we call it the Forager, app, app name. Uh, you can see uh, it has a very fancy uh, transducer that, that is mounted on, on this uh, davit here that goes over the side and that collects uh, all the data on the smelt. We have a trawl net that attaches to this boom and winch mechanism here. That's how we actually sample the, the fish to know what we're seeing on the sounder. This is the, the computer screen on the boat. It actually shows, it's a very fancy depth sounder basically. It shows, you can see the bottom, the bottom of the lake here. And all these little uh, markings here are, are school, is a schools of smell uh, throughout the lake that we, that we uh, observe. And we'll get actually, these are the little black caddis that come off the, the water and, and they're attracted to the, the computer screen. So sometimes you gotta have to brush those away. This is the, the, the trawl net, as you see behind the boat uh, being deployed. And this is what we're after. This is the, the, the young of the year smelt uh, that we take the data on and, and we're measuring there to get an idea of food abundance for the salmon. If it's a good year, you know, mediocre year or a bad year. And actually, lately, it's been really good, especially in Wapasaki. There's just tons and tons of smelt in the lake now. Sometimes we'll get a little bit of older smelt in the catch too, but mostly they're the little guys, the young of the year. I think this was from last year. Oh, so we had a good, good showing last year. This year has been pretty good too. All right, jumping to some management uh, in our warm water program here. Um, I'm getting a little short on time here, so I'm not gonna read my slides here, but this is some of the data that we collect uh, when we're out there uh, looking at bass populations throughout the lake. And we have some neat equipment for doing that. Uh, it's called an electrofishing boat. Uh, it runs electric current through the water and, and uh, then the fish are netted out of the water and put in a live well in the boat that doesn't harm them and it works great. And our goal is to sample about eight different lakes in a year. Sometimes you'll, if you've ever seen this, you know, this is what all you're seeing out on the water at night is the boat with its lights. Uh, you, get, you know, this is all done at night in the dark. And just some other shots of some of the process here of electrofishing, guys getting ready to net fish. They go in a live well on the boat and then we mar uh, work up the data, lengths and weights, you know, just like, we do with a lot of other of our other of our fish species. We also use uh, what we call fike netting or trap nets. Uh, sometimes in the spring uh, and during the summer for sampling warm water fish populations. These just basically a big minnow trap, and it works pretty much the same. Where fish will swim along the shore and be funneled into the, the back end of the net. And this is again, just some of the data that we look at, the uh, catch per unit effort, like how many fish per net hour. Uh, some statistics, we, we have a statistic called relative weight or proportional stock density uh, that tells us if there's too, you know, too few large fish or too few small fish in a lake. And just gives us an idea of this community structure uh, of, the, of, the, of the warm water fish in the lake. We also take scale samples and or spine samples from the fish that we're able to age by looking at the various, you know, almost like a tree, you know, that's how you age either spines or scales. You can see these annual markings that tells you how old the fish is. And we've done some special project with bass. We did a radio tagging study a few years ago. We're inserting radio transmitters, doing actual surgery on the fish. I think this was on Squam Lake, we did the study. And then we're able to follow them around with uh, antennas, you know, using an antenna and, and 
figuring out where the fish go. This was part of a study to look at post-release movement of bass after tournament weigh-ins. Uh, we were concerned that the fish weren't finding their way back to where they you know, were caught, but we found in this study that I think it was like 85% of the fish went back on their own to where they were caught, so that's a good thing. I can't uh, leave the talk without saying something about stocking. Um, we have a large stocking program throughout the state uh, and it's trout. We don't have, we don't stock anything other than trout or salmon. Um, and it just, there's just not enough fish to produce naturally for folks, uh, enough cold water species to support a fishery without stocking because our waters are very sort of sterile uh, and just can't support the biomass uh, for the modern fishermen. This just gives some numbers uh, last year's stocking numbers. I'm not going to talk in detail about it, but you'll have it there if you want to refer back to that of what we stock, you know, for species and versus streams and then what's in the lakes. We have six hatcheries spread throughout the state where we raise our fish. And an interesting sort of lake small pond program that we have really the stocking is the aerial stocking program where uh, brook trout fry are stocked through uh, using a helicopter. It's about 50 ponds, mostly in the mountains and in areas where you can't drive to. And it works pretty well, actually. It does, uh, and then these, some of these ponds do grow some nice, nice trout when there's, you know, they're only stocked, they're about three inches long. And, and this is a good way, this is, a lot of people will fish these remote ponds in these uh, float tubes or belly boats, they're called. It's a, it's a good way to, to do it, because it would be hard to, haul up a canoe or a, or, a, or a kayak up to some of these ponds. So, so brief, sort of sort of winding down here before we run out of time. Uh, uh, I just wanna mention, you know, the fishing uh, in New Hampshire has, has a pretty high economic impact. It does generate uh, a, a good number of dollars in, in, jo in jobs and wages. Um, this data is, you know, from 2011, but uh, it's probably so some of these not figures have probably changed since then, but I just wanted to throw that out there just to show you. The other part of management uh, uh, involves, you know, asking people in, through surveys that we do of what, you know, what they're preferring, what they like to, what they want for management. And you can see this is just sort of a species, species preference question that we had on a survey we did a few years ago. That you know, and I mentioned largemouth bass is the most popular fish. Well, that proved the survey did prove that, and it actually tied with rainbow trout. Now, it used to be trout used to be number one, but it was in the last you know ten years now that bass became more more popular. And this sort of how satisfied are you? You know, we asked folks about the different species here, and you can see a lot of green. Green means good in this slide. That people are either overall satisfied, they're either very or moderately satisfied with that particular fish species, uh, fishery. Uh, I just wanted to throw this in to show where people fish. And um, if you look at the blue, that means uh, that's where uh, percentage of people fishing in lakes. So more people fish in lakes uh, than they do in streams. The streams are red and the lakes are blue here in this slide. That's not too surprising. Also, as part of the management, we permit fishing tournaments. Uh, we have about 450 tournaments a year, roughly. Um, <clears throat> very popular um, throughout the state here. And, um, and we do have a, quite a, a management uh, program for that. Actually, uh, one of the cool things about tournament is now there's high school bass fishing is a, is a, is a, a, a sport now. And this started a few years ago, and it's a good way to get the youngsters involved and, and keep, keep them as lifelong fishermen. So kind of winding up here, what are some challenges uh, to, to lake management of fishes? Well, invasive species is always a concern. Um, you know, we want people to be uh, careful of what they're, where they're bringing in and clean, drain, dry is the mantra nowadays uh, in regards to boats. Lake drawdowns are sort of a challenge for us to fisheries. Uh, you're losing a lot of habitat for fish when drawdowns happen. I know it's kind of a historical thing here in New England, but again, it, it's not that good for fish. Development, 
uh, manicured lawns, not the best uh, for fish habitat and effects on fish. So we'd like to see more vegetation uh, and more natural, you know, looking shorelines. Uh, challenge for us is our fish hatcheries. They're, they're getting very old, some of them, and it's a challenge to keep them going. The, the costs and maintenance of them are, are pretty difficult. So how can you guys help? How can you guys help New Hampshire fisheries in our lakes and things? Well, one thing you can do is buy a fishing license, right? That's how we're funded. Even if you don't think you like to fish, you can still buy a license. You don't, it's not like a hunting license where you need special safety training and, it, and it's funds that support the department. So, uh, so that's one thing. Be a good land steward, you know, be, be aware of what you do on your property. If you live on the lake shore, uh, can affect, you know, the critters in the lake. Uh, please, please, please don't, if you have aquarium fish, don't let them go if they get too big for your tank. <laughs> we, we come upon some weird things, uh, uh, pakus, uh, chiclets, uh, uh, fire eels. Uh, there was a fire eel that was found in the Merrimack River recently that someone must have let go. Uh, it was dead, but uh, yeah, we don't want people stocking, st stocking our lakes with weird things. Uh, if you see phishing violations, you know, we have an 800 number, Operation Game Thief, that, that, that you, know, you know, report those folks. And then just share the resource is, you know, that lake, because, you know, public waters, you know, lakes greater than 10, 10 acres or greater, they belong to everyone. So uh, just, just keep that in mind, too, um, when you're out there. And I think then there aren't going to be much time for questions. <laughs> Oh, Scott, that was awesome. I learned a ton and um, I will definitely be going to check out your slides later for all the nitty gritty details. Uh, for those of you who do need to leave at eight, know that this full recording will be posted and the slides will be posted. But if you are able to stay and Scott, if you're able to stay, maybe we'll stay a little bit past eight because I know Jessica got a whole bunch of really good questions in the <laughs> chat box. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. That was great. Um, I'm jealous that my high school doesn't offer fishing as a class. Um, oh, yeah. It's too bad. <laughs> um, I'll dive right in. I do have a lot, um, a lot of good questions. Um, I'll start off with um, people noticing fewer, fewer crayfish in Winnipesaukee versus, you know, 50 years ago. Um, are they moving deeper? Are they being eliminated by those rockfish or any idea on that? Well, it's, it's hard to say. Um... Yeah, the lakes are changing, I think, you know, from 50 years ago. You know, we heard from uh, the DES folks, you know, the browning of lakes uh, on the pH is changing. Uh, more new, more uh, stuff is running into lakes, it seems. That could be an effect. I think also it's just the lakes aren't as dirty. People clean up their shorelines. They, they rake everything out and, you know, that stuff crayfish feed on. So, uh, you know, lakes can sometimes be too clean. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Um, I have a real good question. Um, have you noticed um, any high fish kills, um, specifically perch this year, or, um, you know, any more than others, I guess? Pro probably not as, uh, any more than any other year, um, but it's been a tough year. Uh, it's been very warm, mm -hmm. uh, lack of rainfall, and we have heard some perch kills in Squam Lake not too long ago, uh, maybe a couple other lakes, and then the usual sunfish, you know, we get sunfish die-offs in various lakes almost every year. And that's sort of a natural thing. It's sort of a, a thinning of the population uh, that happens uh, when they build up to a certain level and not, not, not a horrible thing. And it's not, it's mostly a natural occurrence, not caused by pollution. Right. Um, someone was wondering how um, active the state works with Trout Unlimited, um, what kind of relationship you guys have with them. Oh, uh, on, on stream stuff, uh, uh, we have a very good relationship um, right. uh, that we work them on, mostly uh, with uh, wood additions uh, to streams to improve habitat in streams. Um, we work very closely with the TU chapters on that. Awesome. Great. Um, let's see. See. You mentioned the stocking, um, especially in the northern part of the states and higher altitudes. Um, do stocking ponds um, with those altitudes have any impacts on native amphibians um, or any, you know, other native fish in those or um, don't see much of a difference? 
Uh, it's something that is really not studied that I, that I'm aware of. Um, certainly, uh, you know, those ponds, um, they probably had wild populations, you know, years ago and we're just, you know, sort of helping them. Acid rain sort of hurt a lot of those ponds, but that situation is improving. Um, but you know, the stocking that we do, um, uh, they're such a small size, um, you know, they're almost like wild fish basically when, when they grow up. So we're sort of imitating the natural conditions as much as possible. Yeah, great. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, someone mentioned not seeing many Lake Whitefish. Um, how is that population this year? <laughs> uh, lake Whitefish are very rare. Um, it's just uh, over time with the introductions of, you know, bass and things over time, you know, th those fish, uh, have just sort of naturally just thinned out or unnaturally, you know, it's, uh, you can still catch some white fish here and there uh, in Winnipesaukee, um, uh, the lake white fish. And then we have populations around white fish that we're trying to restore uh, in the North country. There's a, uh, an experimental project going on. I think where we actually uh, uh, took eggs from the wild from round white fish and uh, fertilized them uh, and then actually raise some in the hatchery system. Let's see. Um, we have another question about um, stocking. Um, many ponds, um, someone mentioned ponds are shallow, you know, for example, 12 feet or so. Um, do stock trout make it through the winter in these more shallow bodies of water? Primarily the, the spring stocking program of the, you know, the, the, the 10, 11, 9, 10, 11 inch trout are, are meant to be caught out before that gets too warm in those shallow ponds. Um, and so we don't expect them to be, you know, surviving too much okay. you know, through the summer. It's the deeper waters, say ponds that are at least 20 to 30 feet deep that they may do, they may find cold enough water, um, oxygenated cold water. Uh, is, is important. It can be cold and not be oxygenated down there. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so the O2 level is important. Awesome. Um, let's see, I think I've, I've covered a lot. Um, if people want to submit any real quickly, feel free. Um, I have a question for you, Scott. I was wondering, you know, since your, your move to New Hampshire and your beginning career, have you noticed um, some good changes, you know, since your start and, you know, maybe some, some patterns or anything you could take from your beginning of your career to now that we could kind of touch on? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think um, uh, over time, uh, you know, certain, certain work has been done uh, to help our biologists learn more about our environment here and our fisheries in the North Country. I know uh, a lot of research has been done with brook trout in the, in the diamond system in that area of the state that we, um, you know, we didn't know much about. Uh, so certain areas of the state, yes, you know, like the smelt program uh, with our trawling and the sonar, uh, that started about 30 years ago, about the time I started. And we've learned quite a bit uh, how to improve our, our you know, our salmon stocking based on that data that we collect on the smell. So th those are a couple things that, that come to mind. Awesome. Thanks. Um, Jessica, did you ask uh, the questions about crayfish yet? I might have missed that. I did, yes. I, okay. I started with that one, um, but I did forget the one. Um, someone wants to discuss the rock bass in Winnipesaukee, if right. we could. Um, what's the story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they seem to be doing very well. Um, like Sunapi a few years ago uh, when they were accidentally introduced there. Um, not by us, not by Fishing Game, but others. Uh, I think what'll happen is they'll be problematic, quote unquote problematic, and then you'll see them drop back. They'll level off at a certain, you know, and then they'll just, they may drop, drop back. Uh, but time will tell, we'll see. I, what I try to do is I try to encourage people to, to keep them, but to eat them. All right. <laughs> Don't just throw them in your garden. Uh, they're, they're very edible. They taste great. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I did have a question that was early on in the chat box. Um, were there native salmon in Winnipesaukee prior to the dams? It's possible, yeah. That's Very cool. possible. Uh, although mostly what happened years ago was the salmon would come up the Merrimack and would go at the junction of the Winnipesaukee River and the Pemi River that forms the Merrimack. The salmon, Atlantic salmon would go north farther on the, on the Pemi and spawn and the shad uh, would go take a right in the Winnipesaukee and go up and spawn up there. So not really, Winnipesaukee was never a, a, a salmon hotspot. There's a, a, Jessica, I saw there's a question. Are lakes cleaner now thir um, versus 30 years ago um, due to new septic requirements or is this offset by runoff from lawns? And I can uh, talk a little bit about that. Certainly um, with um, some lakes having municipal sewers put around them, um, that has certainly improved water quality in lakes which have gone through that process. But certainly most of our lakes do not have municipal sewers around them. Most of us are on septic systems. Um, so in general, septic systems and septic um, you know, regulations and septic system technology has certainly gotten better over the year, years. So, um, but we do still think that septic systems are part of the um, nutrient loading, you know, contributing nutrients to our lakes. Um, and Vicki, you're right on with your question. Now we're really concerned about stormwater runoff or the runoff water coming off of our uh, properties like like Scott was showing, you know, properties that um, are not having natural vegetation are helping more phosphorus get into our lakes, which then changes, um, you know, the algaes that are growing there in the plants and um, potentially favors more um, harm, harmful um, algaes. Um, and Scott, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything there. I think, um, yeah, it's like a change. I, I don't know. It, it, it seems like they are cleaner. I mean, you take Lake Winnesquam, for instance, you know, when, you know, a lot of the sewage used to go almost directly into the lake. Um, <clears throat> and now it's a lot cleaner, but it's, you know, the smelt population is, is really taking a dive there because of, there's just less plankton now, you know, uh, for them. So, uh, yeah, I think the, all, the other thing we're seeing is climate change too, I think is gradually, you know, messing with things and it's going to make it, you know, uh, our fisheries could, could be changing to more of the warm water fisheries versus the cold water. Well, I think um, we have one sort of last kind of fun question. Um, so how old can fish get? You know, what's like the oldest fish or the biggest fish that you think might be in our lakes somewhere? <laughs> well, hands down, that would be lake trout. Some of them, like I say, the couple of big ones there I showed in the photos were probably 50 or 60 year old fish. Wow. Yeah. So um, that's probably the max. <laughs> Not many. Wow. Probably most fish don't live much beyond, you know, probably four or five years. Okay. Well, this has been awesome. Um, just a sure, little. Oh, no, just this was great. Um, so to, for those of you who are still here, uh, thank you for. Um, joining us this evening. Again, uh, you'll get an evaluation in just a few minutes from me. Please let us know how we did and do tell us things you want to learn about in the future. Uh, we're going to start doing at least monthly webinars from now until, you know, at some point next spring. Um, again, you'll receive an email from me tomorrow with links to this presentation. Um, I want to thank Scott. Uh, thank you for spending your evening with us. Again, I learned a ton. I can't wait to uh, review the slides. And um, Jessica, thank you for facilitating the, the question session. And Scott, um, any, any last parting words? Hey, get out and enjoy the lakes. Uh, <laughs> learn how to fish if you, if you, if you haven't tried it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, again, let us know how we did and be well and keep in touch and, and buy your fishing license. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. See ya.